Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for prioritizing the Black Rural South. I'm Spencer Overton. I'm president of the Joint Center. We're joined today by our esteemed panelists here. Uh, we have uh, uh, Alita Fitzgerald, who's the board chair for the Southern Rural Women's, I'm sorry, the Southern Rural Black Women's, Black Women's, that's operative uh, here, <laughs> Women's Initiative uh, here, and has just been a, a long time Joint Center friend and partner, and we work together. We appreciate her coming up. We've got Mr. Clint Odom, who's the VP for Strategic Alliances and External Affairs at T-Mobile. And, you know, Clint was a top, there are just very few top Senate staffers. Uh, Clint uh, played that role for Senator Harris, and he's just been a long time friend of the Joint Center, great judgment, uh, somebody we call on for counsel, and we just appreciate you. Now that you're at T-Mobile, still doing great stuff, and we certainly appreciate your support of the Joint Center. Uh, we've got Dr. Corey Wiggins, who's the federal co-chair of the Delta Regional Authority. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is a uh, big deal, uh, as you will see. You know, he's got on his board uh, governors uh, of, of various states. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about the Delta Regional Authority, but it is a, a huge uh, deal, and we're, we're really appreciative of him for being here. We have got Dr. Dominique Harrison, who she is the Director of Racial Equity Design and Data Initiative at City Venture Studio. Uh, more importantly for us, she's a Joint Center alum. She's the author of uh, the seminal report on the topic, uh, Expanding Broadband in the Black Rural South. Um, and so we're just so glad she came home and she's a, a part of us uh, today in terms of this session. And then we've also got our good friend Robert Branson, who's the president and CEO of the Multicultural Media, Telecom, and Internet Council. Uh, and they have been, you know, longtime partners of the Joint Center. Uh, and also, uh, Mr. Branson has a great deal of depth in terms of the FCC and just a long, long time uh, expertise uh, here in this space. So, uh, we're just going to go ahead and get started. And uh, I'm, I'm going to call you Ms. Fitzgerald, I, I guess, here, uh, Olita. Uh, we want to start with you and just you work with black families in the black rural south you know so let's just kind of center people could you tell us about you know folks families communities there could you tell us about some of the opportunities in the black rural south uh could you tell us about some of the challenges uh here should i just leave this as it is can you hear me okay Thanks, Spencer, uh, and thanks for inviting us to participate in, uh, in this session today. I've learned a lot and got to meet the, uh, the Secretary of Commerce and critical key people at the Department of Commerce related to broadband expansion, so I appreciate that very much. Uh, for the rural South, the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative does work organizing work in the black belts of Alabama and Georgia and the Delta in Mississippi. We've been doing that work for the last 20 years. Uh, I also wear a second hat, which is the regional director for the Children's Defense Fund, where I've been for 28 years uh, working in the South. Uh, the South, as everybody knows, is a different animal uh, and has been since you know, I guess the inception of time. Uh, I think back uh, on some of the programs I see Debbie Weinstein that we worked on, worked with for a long time. Some of the federal programs that have come in to uh, benefit people who are isolated, whose incomes are low, who are struggling every day. And the programs that have been passed by Congress uh, laudably by a lot of support from the networks that we have here in the advocacy community and how they have rolled out in the South. Uh, start first with Head Start. Uh, Head Start was a program that, uh, that came out of the war on poverty that was to benefit 
children in the rural South who didn't have access and didn't have resources for early childhood education. Uh, when Head Start rolled out as federal policy, the state of Mississippi refused to take the money. Uh, so consequently, and gratefully, actually, uh, Head Start is a program that, that runs directly from the federal government to Head Start agencies and does not go through, have to go through state agencies. Uh, TANF, another program that we worked on, welfare reform. Uh, we fought hard against TANF becoming a block grant. Uh, what the, the news that you all, all hear about Brett Farr and is the tip of the iceberg uh, with the governor involved and the misappropriation and misuse of money that was designated for poor families in the state of Mississippi. While Brett Farr and, and his group of people who are under indictment were getting that money, 80% of the families, and particularly families in the rural South, that are applying for welfare in the state of Mississippi are turned down. Uh, in fact, in the state of Mississippi and across the South and across the country, uh, there's been a rollback of participation in TANF, and I'm, you know, I'm, you know I'm going on here, but um, there are only 3,000 people on TANF in Mississippi. Hmm. A state with a population of three million. Is that because there's no poverty? That's because there's no <laughs> poverty, there's no jobs, there, you know, all of those things that we put in place to say, uh, you know, all the boxes that had to be checked before families could get access. Rural families are, are, were particularly hurt. Um, but yet, that money, that $96 million is coming into the state every day without any guardrails, which is why the story is not Brett Farr. The story is how the state is spending that money and, the, and uh, the access that they have and the lack of oversight for how that money is spent. Child tax credit. Child tax credit came down, it's operated through the uh, uh, through, um, Treasury, goes straight from Treasury to individuals. Individuals in the rural South who lacked access to technology were unable to access those dollars. So unless people on the ground went out and did the grunt work to try to connect them to those resources. And then there's broadband. So as we know, rural communities have struggled um, as they did in, in the 1940s when electricity rolled out through rural, the Rural Electric Administration. Um, REA ran the lines, uh, paid to have electricity run in communities for the same reason that we are struggling with broadband in rural communities. It, it doesn't meet anybody's business model. So it has to have support from federal and other kinds of resources. Because people live so far apart, uh, they're not clustered, uh, it costs a lot to run the lines, so it is not a money maker. Unless, it, unless it's tied to something else. So we come with where we are now, and I'll stop Spencer with broadband money. But broadband money is going into every state, and every governor is gonna decide how that money gets spent. So this is why we're here today, talk, having the conversation that we need to have about what we're gonna to have to do in order to ensure that our families, poor families, low-income families, struggling at work, and uh, rural families get access to broadband so that when these billions of dollars are gone and the world says we fixed broadband in America, our folks are not still left behind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Wiggins, could you tell us about the Delta Regional Authority? I only got to know about it a couple of years ago and was really you know, uh, impressed. You're the co-chair. As I understand it, there's some overlap between the Delta region and the Black Rural South counties and areas like Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Um, tell us about some of the challenges that state and local governments may face in improving you know, some, some of the conditions and addressing some of these issues in the Black Rural South. Sure, no, no problem, thank you. Uh, DRA, or Delta Regional Authority, is a federal regional commission. Um, there are a number of us that oper operate across the U.S., including Appalachian Regional Commission, 
Southeastern Crescent, uh, which is now operating across um, the southeastern United States and northern border as well. Uh, but we are, are set up as a, a collaboration between federal and state government. Um, I serve as co-chair along with the, uh, Governor Alabama. Our eight states that you mentioned, each of the governors serve on the board or, or have a designee that serve on our board. We cover 252 counties and parishes across that region. Uh, and so my function in that role is, is dual, is dually purpose. Co-chairing the board and also serving as CEO of, of the agency. Um, you know, a little bit about what we do and how this really sort of connect to some of the challenges we're seeing across the region. We are a grant, ma a grant making agency. Um, we, we do grant making to, to municipalities, counties, parishes, and sort of public bodies around basic public infrastructure from water to sewer to workforce development and training programs across the region. Over the past two weeks uh, as an agency, we have deployed a little over $50 million in our region um, to Every, covering everything from small business development to economic development projects to roads and bridges to water and sewer, all those things we talk about, uh, about how do we support, you know, thriving, vibrant communities. Um, I myself is from a, uh, a rural town in Mississippi. Uh, Alita and I have spent a lot of time working together. Prior to this role, I served as executive director for the NAACP in Mississippi and have been in many fights with Alita uh, on a number of issues across uh, in our state. But ultimately, when we talk about the challenges, and I would sort of frame it in this way, right now we're, we have an abundance of resources to deploy across our country. Um, through a non number of the policy initiatives from the administration, what we also have to do, and the privilege that we have as sort of the commissions, mm -hmm. we are really boots on the ground for government for many of the folks that we come in touch with, particularly those smaller towns and communities and, and parishes. And in that role, what I'm seeing is, is that when you get into talking about towns where you have mayors who work part time, uh, they may have only two employees in the city or the county. They do not have the sort of economic engine of what you think about that larger counties or parishes may have. Uh, they are relying on, on their planning and development districts to develop grants if they can get the attention of that to planning and development district because they don't have grant writers. They don't. Uh, we have people who are in their administration who are managing federal grants, and it's the city clerk, the one who's having to manage the grant, in addition to sort of helping to support the city with their finances. And so while we have an abundance of resources to deploy, when you have communities who have been facing challenges long entrenched, deep, have been there uh, for a number of years, um, and the way that I describe it is this, if you have been focused most of your life on trying to find a meal to eat today, and if somebody is telling you about planning for a meal next week and next month, you can't think about the meal tomorrow. You are so focused on, can I feed my family today? So many of the places that we serve in our region have been so focused on trying to keep water flowing in my city or my town today trying to keep the basic utilities, our basic public infrastructure. Can I get caught up from historic sort of disinvestment? Can I, can I, can I move from where I was to where I am just today? And so with resources now being deployed, supporting them to think about the psychology of, of going from scarcity to abundance, that is a role that we're having to find ourselves play and support. So all of the challenges of that we think about sort of that happens in a lot of our urban corridors, think about that, what that means from a infrastructure or a system where you don't have really any supports at all in terms of investment, support of thinking about how you implement, how you plan, and how you design. Because you never had the opportunity to think about that because you've been focused on the things that you need to be focused on on running your community or town today. So those challenges are the things that we're seeing and what we're trying to do um, you know, as that, that front door government is work and support leaders communities in thinking, whether it's through our grant making process around strategic planning grants and others that we're starting to deploy in our region, where it is giving folks the opportunity to think about how they want their communities to look, feel, touch, and smell. That's what we're finding ourselves to do to help support folks in thinking about how they address these challenges and not just how they catch up, but how they also are trying to plan for tomorrow.
And, and, and just a quick point on this Delta Regional Authority, right, just generally. In this country, we're really good at innovating in terms of new ideas and generating wealth uh, here, right? We're not always good in terms of after things have been automated, right? So if you think about how much wealth was produced in terms of cotton and then the unfortunate you know, practice of uh, slavery and then later sharecropping, you know, over half of our exports for the first six decades of the 1800s was cotton. Cotton was the number one export through 1932. And it was eventually automated, right? If you think, and that's obviously the Crescent area here in terms of the Black Belt, right? If you think about the Mississippi, and when I say Mississippi, I'm not just talking about the state of Mississippi. I'm talking up to like Illinois, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This notion of mm -hmm commerce all the way up and down here and then people moving to the area and then their jobs eventually being automated here in terms of that. So you have all these people who live there but not as many jobs. You think about Appalachia and energy and things being automated. Uh, and now we have an Appalachian Regional Commission to deal with it. So these commissions in part are designed to try to address those issues, but we need to really do just a better job, I'll just say as a country, right, in terms of when communities come and they come together and industry goes elsewhere and innovation and resources, how do we transition people to kind of a new mm -hmm. uh, economy uh, uh, here? Um, Dr. Harrison. Joint Center focuses much of its work on the Black Rural South. You know we focused on uh, introduction to the future work in the Black Rural South. You wrote the leading report on expanding broadband in the Black Rural South and you know accessibility and availability. You wrote that for the Joint Center. Many of your recommendations were included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Tell us what did you find about the lack of broadband in the Black Rural South? Uh, what, what are the primary challenges to obtaining broadband in, in the region? Uh, and why is expanding broadband so important to expanding opportunity in the region? Thanks, Spencer, and really happy to be here. So I just wanted to start off by saying, you know, what was so innovative about that report is that the black belt, which was a term defined by Booker T. Washington, was to describe, um, you know, the abundance of African Americans in the rural South and uh, across the country. And over the years, that definition has changed uh, to include black folks that occupy areas um, in which make up, you know, their 40% of the population. Um, but that includes data of metropolitan and rural black Americans. And so what we did in our data to define the black rural south was to say, we're going to look at um, populations across the rural south that have 35% or higher black folks, um, and we're going to focus on rural areas. And so that's what makes our data uh, really creative and innovative in terms of why we chose to focus um, on that specific community. Um, what you'll find in the debate on broad ban in conversations is often when the term rural is used, it's often conflated with white. And so black Americans in the rural uh, South don't get as much attention as it relates to access to the internet. So our data, which included 152 counties across 10 states in the South, um, and what we found is that 49.2% uh, of the region's population is made up of black people. And if you think about it uh, holistically, black people across the U.S. make up 13%. So are there are a lot of black folks in the South, right? Again, just kind of emphasizing the importance of highlighting that community. So what we found is that lack of high-speed uh, access to broadband is a very important issue. And the issue is as, as it relates to affordability and availability of the services. So that means that the infrastructure is not there. And then if the infrastructure is not there, then it's not affordable. So people do not have the means to pay for it. We also found that 38% of African American residents in the black rural South do not have access to broadband. And that is a, a large number of people uh, who don't have you know, access to technology that, as we have seen during this pandemic, is very essential to our daily lives, right, and the activities that we perform each day. Um, 
36% of black students in the rural South lack access to high-speed broadband. You know, you think about when schools went online and the number of people who didn't have internet at home, including students who you may have saw in many stories had to go to places like McDonald's parking lot mm -hmm. um, or other kinds of restaurants just to be able to access wireless internet in America in 2020. Right. Um, what we also find is that as it relates to affordability, 49% of black children live in poverty in the black rural south. Right. So again, um, availability and affordability of the services is a challenge. So infrastructure in the rural south is just not there. Right. And as Ms. Fitzgerald said earlier, it's not seen as a profitable area. So because communities are sparsely, you know, um, uh, all, you know, communities are sparse, that means that people don't want to have to develop, you know, infrastructure to be able to serve these houses that can be spread across several miles, right? And so they go to more concentrated, um, higher profit areas, as as what's described in the report, um, to provide services there. Um, you know, affordability is one of the number one problems for African Americans as it relates to broadband services. Pew Research says that, you know, 44% of households with incomes less than $35,000 uh, uh, lack broadband. And in the black rural south, 60.8% of black households make $35,000 or less. Right. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities in providing more infrastructure uh, of broadband services in the area, as well as providing affordable prices so people can access that. Um, and in the report, we talk about the opportunities to increase earnings and job growth. S research shows that the more uh, that there is broadband access, that people are able to earn more money and provide uh, find new ways to um, you know build businesses, but also connect with other people across uh, the. US to maintain those businesses, do remote work, um, and advance entrepreneurship. We talk about opportunities to create educational attainment, right? And when we think about online education, not just for young people, but adults who want to switch careers and are able to get education from universities across America. Um, we also talk about opportunities to improve health outcomes. I mean, when you look at the data, there are stark outcomes in the amount of hospitals that have closed across the rural south. So if you have closure of hospitals, you have medical uh, uh, staff or people who are moving actually to other regions across America in terms of being able to have other opportunities, then there's a lack of you know, uh, health services for individuals. So one of the ways to remedy that is by having a number of telehealth services in which people can be able to access um, doctors and specialists via their computer at home. But again, you need broadband to do that, and it needs to be a affordable. So those are just some of the highlights that I just wanted to talk about um, in the report. But just emphasizing that, you know, as we think about what's to come with funding and how to address these issues, it's really important to focus on these kinds of communities and the specific concerns that they have. So um, Mr. Branson and, uh, and Dr. Harrison, I'm going to basically have you <laughs> kind of follow up on this in terms of We've heard about the infrastructure bill in terms of, or law, I should say, $65 billion. Could you give us just a snapshot about what the law does uh, here? And, um, you know, Dr. Harrison, anything you want to input, uh, provide in terms of, uh, you know, federal and local investments here on that? And then, if the two of you all, I'm kind of pulling this all together, just talk about, and Ms. Fitzgerald talked about it, and we'll come back to her, but th this concern about that the Joint Center has raised in filings with the, the FCC, that southern state officials could deploy broadband in areas with most of their supporters in kind of a way from black rural south areas. So just kind of a snapshot of the law and kind of where we are in the process uh, here. And then also this issue about money going to states and never really making it to the black rural south as a possibility. Yeah, so I would say that um, the IIJA does a lot of remarkable things in terms of uh, 
you know, trying to address issues uh, specifically as it relates to broadband deployment and to ensure that there is equal access and equitable outcomes for specific communities. Um, there is prioritization of build out and deployment in rural areas, as well as um, making sure that these funds go to uh, communities of color. Um, there are a lot of grants um, uh, dedicated to broadband deployment and digital equity um, that, uh, again, are trying to address these uh, issues for unserved populations um, and those living in the rural areas. And I think that it's a great path forward in trying to address the issue of the digital divide and provide um, more access. But one of the things that's really important um, as has been raised is as this all of this money is coming down, state and local leaders really need to understand what is going on in their community. That means that there needs to be accurate, robust, and disaggregated data to understand who does not have access, um, you know, if they can afford access to uh, the broadband and any other kind of opportunities or needs for that community. I mean, if you think about it, if you're trying to achieve a goal or solve a problem, if you don't know what the issue is, then how are you gonna solve the problem, right? And I think by doing these kinds of studies and getting equity, uh, digital equity plans ready in place uh, as the money is coming through, those leaders can think strategically about where money should go first in order to address some of these problems. And you know, it was interesting um, that you said, Dr. Wiggins, that you know, everything from having someone be able to apply to a grant uh, to kind of filling out forms, and even when I think about the research that should be conducted, some of the things that we talked about in the report is the kind of partnerships that need to be developed in that moment. So leaders should be working together with people in the university, right? Universities have a lot of kind of brain, um, a lot of, excuse me, expertise, um, and they have more time, I would say, and efforts to focus on some of these issues. So I give that as an example to say that if there are research that should be done, you might partner with the university to see if this is something that can be achieved, right, as the state is dealing with multiple kind of ways to address concerns that they might have. Um, and so just wanted to to talk about partnerships there. But again, just emphasizing that data is needed in order to address these concerns. And um, one way to do that is by really getting an, uh, to, to, to see what are the kind of opportunities and challenges there. It's oh, thank you. Oh, first, let me, let me thank you for, for inviting me here, Spencer. I, didn't, I appreciate that. You know, it's always nice to have a, a place at a table or be in the room where it happens, which <laughs> uh, you know, and, I, and you, you point out the number we have for the, the, the double IJA, you know, and I looked at that 65 million, I can't think, but Lord, that's a lot of money. But that's not all. We have other money I'm out sorry, there. I'm sorry, what did well. you say? Some I'm doing Chris you Rock. <laughs> yeah, I think you said 65 million, right? Six, 65 billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 sorry for that. That's even more yeah. money. Yeah, 65 billion. So that, 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 I mean, that is that is historic, and that's not only. You know, we also had the B money and other other funds. We we also have the Merc, excuse me, Emergency Connectivity Fund, which is out there, and many states have come up with their own money. So I mean, I mean, this is historic. The amount of money is out there, but I mean, I, but I I take a seat back and first I start looking at it from where I'm from. I'm from a little small town in Virginia called Montrose, Virginia, real small. I guarantee no one here probably has heard of it. It's so small. But my mother is still there, and I look at what she has to deal with. You know, on Sunday morning, she gets up. You know, she's 98 years young, so she can't really go to church too well these days, so she wants to watch church service on the Internet. And guess what? It ain't that, it ain't that easy because there's no broadband there. I mean, she has, like, basically the equivalent of dollop that, 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 that she gets from... Uh, uh, Verizon, you know, with, with her little Wi-Fi signal, half the time it cuts out, and either at her house or at the church. So, I have a personal interest why I like to see money go there. And, and I want to, and she is in, in the rural area and in the south. And so, so you know, we really, we really are looking at this. How we, how do we have someone like my mother improve her life so she can do what she wanted to do? Now, you pointed out something regarding uh, the, the, the states and what they may do with the money. I happen to actually have a little bit of experience on that. Uh, a few years back, when I when I was in my other job uh, working with Verizon, I was appointed by uh, Governor Larry Hogan to the Maryland uh, Rural Broadband Task Force. It's a two-year task force, and we were we were set up to be able to look at how to get rural broadband in Maryland. You know, 
I wasn't at MMTC then, so I, I, I guess it didn't really hit me as hard as it hit me once I got out of MMTC that there weren't a whole lot of people in the room when we were making these discussions that looked like me. And I'm sure many of you can, can, can relate. And there weren't organizations like the Joint Center or like MMTC or others who made presentations. Now, there, now there, in Maryland at that time and still now, there, there was a black lieutenant governor. He did come in there and he did talk. And I think he did show some concerns. And, and obviously, while I may have worked for Verizon, my heart still was with the, you know, the black folk who live in those part of, part of uh, uh, Maryland. Uh, we, and we, we did make some great recommendations. We didn't have the money that we have now. So, so we, have a, we have an opportunity now to do a whole lot more. But what I wanted to see more, though, is I wanted to see people in these meetings with the governor, in the meetings with the, the, the mayors and others, talking about issues. That, that's why my organization, uh, we looked at, okay, who can we get to be out boots on the ground, to go out here and talk to these people and be in these meetings? Well, the group we decided to work with are the black churches because we knew during the pandemic that uh, uh, besides McDonald's, the church parking lot or the church was a lot, oftentimes the place where people would go and, and get their homework done and the kids would be there to learn. And when, when people needed to learn how to work uh, on computers, well, the church provided centers that, that, that helped them do that. So we, we've gone through with them, and, and, and we have been working with 25-plus uh, uh, spiritual leaders throughout the country. Uh, we, we right now are focused on having them sign up people for the ACP program, and I can't, you know, I, I got to, I, sorry, but I got to do a little promotional here. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is our website, and we knew the best way to get people, in a, and if you've been to a black church, you know you got to have that fan in my wrong. <laughs> So we, we passed these up so people could have them and show, show, show them how they can sign up for the ACP. We're not, we're not gonna finish, finish here though. I mean, that's, that's, that's stage one. We, we, we also know that, 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 that you can give them a benefit. You can give them the $30 per month, you, and which basically will give them free internet service. Uh, but that's not it if, if they don't know how to use the service. Mm -hmm. So that the next step after we get it, more people signed up is, is to work with the leaders to, to, to provide more education. And so that's, our, that's, that's where we will turn to as soon as we start signing up more people. So we were hoping to, uh, in fact, we, we have a sign up this weekend. We have one next weekend in New York City. So we're trying to get as many people as possible because there's a lot of money, and, but, but, but the money is no good if it doesn't come into the communities that need it the most. And, and, and that's what we're focused on. And I, I just want to add really quickly, you know, I didn't even talk about, you know, broadband access also includes, like you've said, Bob, like training to be able to use the technology, right? So that's a part of the funding in which can be used for that. Um, and also the technology, right, to actually buy a computer or a laptop to be able to use the broadband that's going to be in your home. So much of that funding can be going towards that as well. And that's a part of this whole story on broadband access. And, and we, we did a program a couple weeks ago over at Martha's Table, uh, working with Metropolitan AME. And in order to get people there, we actually, we actually raffled off some laptops. And actually, to really get them there, we, we, we auctioned off an iPhone 14 Pro. But that's, <laughs> but that's one way of getting people there. <laughs> so, so let me tee up kind of, I'm a law professor. Let me put my law professor hat on and tee up a hypo, right? So, and, and Clint, I'll, I'll be coming to you next. Um, th there is a hypothetical world in which Republican Governor Larry Hogan is different than Republican <laughs> Governor Brian Kemp or uh, <laughs> DeSantis in, 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 in Florida, Florida uh, here, right? right. Uh, that, you know, in Georgia, there saying you can't give water and food to people who are in line no. in Florida. We're saying, uh, hey, we're going to prosecute all these folks uh, for voting, uh, uh, you know, who are <laughs> returning we offenders. To After we <laughs> ask them to vote. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. And many of these places, unlike Maryland, and I'm not just defending my Republican governor of my Republican state, but they rejected the uh, Medicaid expansion so that there are about 650,000 black folks who did not have health coverage who otherwise would have, right? And so folks who were in their state, and this was a scenario where like the federal government was picking up 95% of it. It wasn't going to really be any cost to them. It was a decision that adversely affected their own residents, many of whom were black, right? So 
I think that there is this concern with all this money going to these states and the states coming up with plans that a build out in terms of deployment of this $42 billion in bead money will go to political supporters and will be steered away from the people who are voting against uh, some of these statewide candidates, many of whom are in the black rural South uh, here. And uh, I just put that on the table as a mm -hmm. hypothetical. <laughs> Maybe it will never happen. I'm a law professor. So, you know, we just imagine worlds. Exactly. But, uh, exactly. in, in terms of that issue here, mm -hmm. you know, what's the private sector doing to help ensure mm -hmm. equitable build out of broadband in the black rural South? You know, are there things that telecommunications companies can, can do here? Uh, how about non-telecom companies? You know, what can they be doing? Basically just say, look, the law says you're supposed to prioritize unserved areas. Mm -hmm. We just want you to follow the data and prioritize unserved areas and follow the law rather than politics, right? Uh, so what can companies, both telecom and non-telecom companies do to say, hey, this is good for your you know, workforce and education, et cetera, and your economy. What can they do to really help facilitate this? Because it's very possible that the black folks who are in these black communities have limited stroke with regard to some of these elected officials. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Um, and, and although I'm here today uh, representing T-Mobile, you know, I'm, I'm a son of um, Lafayette Parish, Louisiana. I grew up there for the first 21 years of my life. Um, my first job out of law school was uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, working for a federal district court judge down there. Uh, and it's probably one of the most influential professional experiences I've ever had. Um, poverty and the conditions of the rural South were never far from my mind, and they don't, uh, as, as they um, remain today. So let, let me talk a little bit about how T-Mobile is different. Um, there's this $43 billion that is a once in a lifetime mm -hmm. opportunity. To, to put this in context, there's never been a program approaching these dollars in, in the history of the United States. After the Great Recession, maybe we had about $7 billion in BTOP BIP money. Uh, we have an ongoing universal service program, but, but nothing like this. And, and it's also no guarantee that after $43 billion is spent, that this digital divide that we talk about so much will be closed. Right. And, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, T-Mobile is not going to participate in the BEAD program uh, because we have already made a commitment to the government to build out our 5G network, the, the fastest wireless network out there that reaches you know, speeds that you would, might see in a fiber network. We've promised that we're going to build 99% of the United States population are going to have that service. We're at 95% today. We promised that we were going to build 90% of rural America, and we're well on our way to that mark today. Uh, and with respect to coverage of the African American community, th this is not a community that we run away from or see is not a viable business. 95% of our network today covers black population in this country. So uh, I think you will you will soon see that when you talk about broadband coverage in the United States, whether we're talking about bead money or not, T-Mobile is gonna be one of the players that covers most of this country with, uh, with, with broadband. Not, not fiber optics technology, which you know to some is the gold standard, but a technology that is uh, exponentially better than what uh, a lot of folks have today. Uh, the 41% of rural America, the 41% of the population uh, that lives in rural America, this is a customer base that we desperately want uh, and desperately want to introduce ourselves to and, and desperately serve. Uh, as companies that are participating in the BEAD program, and, and some of them you know, are, are in the room today and, and some may even be, be listening, uh, it's gonna be incumbent upon them to pursue a data-driven process. 
one that tells us where broadband is and where it isn't, so that we don't overbuild areas. Wealthy areas or areas that have broadband today shouldn't get it twice, or at least shouldn't be paid by the federal government to do it twice. We've got to look where broadband isn't. If lawmakers and policymakers are smart, they pick up the joint center step from last year and get that data. Uh, if they have any problem finding out where it is, uh, they, they need look no further than that study or their own mapping data to find out where it is. But it does require companies to be responsible uh, and, to, and to be honest and to value the customers they serve. And, uh, and, and I can tell you at T-Mobile, uh, you know, th this, is, this is a brand and this is a company that wants to be in the rural south and we have a product and, and, a, and a business plan for people at every segment of the market. Um, you know, Ms. Fitzgerald made this point earlier about uh, the rural electrification uh, of the United States. And, and I like to remind people that in that effort we built electric wires to every house so that people could plug in an appliance or a light switch. If you build a fiber optic line to every house in the United States, there is still a chance that that light will not come on because it is not a matter of plugging in a computer or plugging in a smart TV. It is a matter of knowing how to use the technology. And although we are very grateful that the government picked up the joint center plan and, and devoted some money to literacy, uh, my friends, we are at great risk of having this once in a lifetime investment not measurably close the digital divide because people still don't know how to use the technology and we've got to focus on that. Can I respond? Mm -hmm. um, excellent, excellent point. Um, I don't think there's any more serious a time um, and um, resources that we could be talking about. Uh, children who are growing up in rural communities mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and communities that are suffering from not having the, the ability to, to as, as Corey said, to go after resources. There is not a job, and I've been attending some of these, these forward-thinking, futuristic <laughs> economies mm -hmm. for the 21st century kind of events. This is, there's a threat and there's an opportunity. If our children are left out of this new economy, and if our children are left in these regions where not only from uh, the things you talked about, Spencer, but also from globalization, mm -hmm. there are no jobs coming to these areas. Mm -hmm. uh, children that are in school districts without functioning equipment, devices, and knowledge are not going to be able to function in this world. Uh, my former boss, my always boss, Marion Knight Edelman, used to say, a child without an education is sentenced to economic and social death. If our children are not able to function in a 21st century economy, they are going to get written off and we're going to see swaths of areas and our people just lost by the wayside. I'd like to follow that with, you know, prior to COVID, prior to the Infrastructure Act, mm -hmm. uh, we recognized that children needed mm -hmm. access to technology from the things that you talked about, Dr. Harrison, from telehealth, but also from an economic development standpoint, uh, that that was a way that you could bring things into rural communities. You could bring business into rural communities. Um, you could also bring education into rural communities, and that got kind of uh, undergirded with COVID because we have so many schools in rural areas where no teacher is wanting to come. And I don't care how much money we're putting out there for, we're gonna pay off your student loans, we're gonna pay for your houses, teachers are not coming in the STEM area. But we have learned that we can bring STEM in mm -hmm. as long as you got a teacher trained and you got the equipment and the things in the classroom, you can pump in that knowledge. 
so that our children can somehow get to the scratch line. Now I want to go back to all of this money that's coming down, all of these billions of dollars, and just kind of set it up. So we knew all of the money, all of the advocate organizations in Mississippi, and we've been working across the region uh, prior to the infrastructure dollars, looking at the money that rural development was getting in the auctions uh, for the REA systems, and targeted 22 counties in the three states where we were working to try to advance um, an agenda around broadband expansion. So then the money starts coming in. And this is something, for those of you who work in Washington, when something gets passed by Congress that's beneficial to us, we should celebrate. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. That money has to be followed all the way down to Miss Jones, who lives on Rural Route 4 mm -hmm. in Madison County. Otherwise, it is not a success. So the money comes into, the broadband money comes into the state of Mississippi. I'll just, we're doing this in Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi. Mississippi, you didn't mention our governor, but. Um, <laughs> the other thing about Mississippi that's different from the states that you talked about is the sophistication of the economic development people in that state. Mm -hmm. And you know, we say Mississippi works hard at being a closed society. We called it <laughs> closed society for one reason before, but we really don't want smart people coming to our state. Mm -hmm. It will upset the policy, the power, <laughs> the power base of the state. So we we give all our money away for somebody to come dance with the, you know, the person that nobody else wants to dance with. And then we tell, you know, so we get that kind of business. That's our business model. But, so the money comes into the state. The states have to set up and say to the Department of Commerce how they're gonna handle the money. So the state of Mississippi set up something called a beam office. Uh, but before that, as it was going through the legislative process, we were all trying to figure out how to, how to get leverage on that before we even got to you know, the money being there. So we all went in for a commission, uh, you know, a broadband commission that would have appointees from the congressional districts of the state. Mm -hmm. That's the legislation that went in the conference committee from both the House and the Senate. When it came out of the conference committees, it came out as the organization would be housed, the, the, uh, the uh, implementation would be housed in the governor's office in the, the, the Department of Finance and Administration. And they would set up a beam office within the Department of Finance and Administration. So what does that do? Now we're told that because it's in the Department of Finance and Administration that grants made to internet service providers, the ISPs, that whole process is proprietary. Mm -hmm. So that we can't see the ISP application mm -hmm. until after it has been lit. And the ISP application will have to say what areas they're going to cover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I say all of that to say that the, the, the federal legislation is always better than what happens on the ground. Yeah. Right. And when you, when you look at this much money, when you look at this much money, so we got ahead of the, uh, uh, the head of the beam office in Mississippi and I was talking to her. And they're checking all of the boxes about equity. They're checking everything. They're having the community meetings. They're okay. doing all this stuff. And people are saying, you know, Sally Doty needs our help. I'm like, Sally Doty don't need your help. You need your own help. Mm -hmm. Because she is gonna say, they, and, and Commerce is gonna say they've done everything mm -hmm. according to the plan but we could still end up with nothing. So what we have been doing in community is actually now a group of organizations are out in community asking people to do their own speed test. Mm -hmm. 
you got to do it because this mapping thing. Yes, yeah, crowdsourcing. It, th this mapping thing, yes, yeah, crowdsourcing, but it's also in doing the speed testing to say to people, wake up, this money is out here, don't y'all be asleep uh, as this money is spent. Because, but back to my conversation with Sally Doty, I asked her at the end of the conversation, and she basically said to me, I'm having to, um, I'm having to adjust the way I'm writing this application so that the state will apply for the equity money. And I, you know, I put some, I got some hope in her because I have to keep hoping something. But at the end of the conversation, I said to her, if there was something that we need to be doing right now, out of all the things we talked about, what would you say we need to do? She said, y'all need to be talking to these ISPs because ultimately that's where the power is going to lie. So for you all here that the T-Mobiles of the world, or I do think fiber works better. We didn't do so good doing with the, with the opera money trying to get over trees and valleys and up and down stuff. You know, it, it, didn't, it didn't come. It didn't come. Okay, we'll take that. But, uh, so, but any help that we could get in this community about how to have conversations with ISPs about what their plans are, because we got to have it on the front end, we're not going to get it on the back end. So, so what I want to do here is I want to give everyone a minute, one minute, and we'll come from uh, down at uh, uh, Mr. Branson, back down this way, with a just final thought about what needs to be done to ensure equitable build out of broadband in the black rural south. You know, what can folks in this room do? You know, what needs to be done? So 30, 60 seconds, right? I'm going to give an additional 30 seconds, 90 seconds so to Dr. Wiggins in terms of you got the governors of Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama on your board. You know, are they coordinating on these issues in terms of infrastructure? You know, how are you all tracking broadband build out generally to ensure uh, equity uh, here? Uh, and so let's just uh go uh, robert just start with you come back this way a minute what what do you want folks to leave with in terms of what can be done and what they need to do in terms of equitable build out with black rural south i'll take less than 60 seconds real quick uh you need to work with people in the community who already have a presence there and that's why we chose the black churches but there are also other groups uh shelby the the, the schools and high uh, libraries they're doing the same thing we're doing. There's another coalition, No Home Left Behind. So there are a lot of groups, but you need to get involved with those groups. You need to tell your people to get involved in those groups because when the decisions are being made, you know, you got to have people who can stand up to the governor, stand up to the commissions they put together, and make sure you are part of the, of, of the solution. And that's the only way to get it done. You've got to be part of the solution. All right. Thank you. So um, I think that was a great point that Ms. Fitzgerald made about holding ISPs accountable. Um, I've been a part of a working group with Bob uh, where we have been thinking very intentionally about uh, a charge that was given to us from the uh, FCC chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel around how do you prevent digital discrimination by ISPs. Digital discrimination means that ISPs is defined as not providing equal access to specific communities based on race, income, I think it's religion, um, etc. And there have been reports of digital discrimination or digital redlining occurring across the US. So despite the fact that ISPs will say that we went into this area and we provided access to all of these communities, the data can sometimes show different. You look at New York, you look at um, uh, Cleveland, and um, I think New York and Cleveland have some good examples there. So my point is to say that those companies should be held accountable, right? In terms of this proprietary information, well, if a company wants to come into the community and build infrastructure and they develop a plan to provide and build out that infrastructure, they should be held accountable for 
building it, the speed test, which is important, right, because a certain speed allows you to do a number of things online, right? That makes that a, an important factor. They should also be required to develop an equity plan, right? You said that you want to provide equitable services to all community members. Let us know what you did. Do you do a test at the beginning and then the end to, you know, allow us to see what has been accomplished? So I think those are some of the mechanisms that communities and leaders need to develop in order to ensure that ISPs are saying what they um, are doing, what they said they are doing, and that no one is left behind because you make less than a certain amount of money or you live in a particular part of a community. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Wiggins. Yeah, sure. Thank you. A couple of things. One thing I would say is, I mean, narrative. We always talk about narrative, and we talk about narrative a lot, even from nonprofit advocacy space. So I would start with narrative first. Narrative in the context of of we don't want to create this other otherism of the rural South, right? We don't want to create that narrative. We want to, I mean, I tend to, and I heard what folks even Clint was talking about his experiences, I will always take an asset-rich approach to the rural South. That's where I'm born and raised. That's where I'm from. That's where my great-grandfather in 1936 purchased 150 acres that my family still live on today. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing and foremost. And so of how we're thinking about that and how that narrative fit is understanding where people are, where people are. So people who come out of policy spaces, nonprofit spaces, who come out of organizing spaces, you know when you organize and when you engage, you meet people where they are. Right? So think about it from a policy framework and how you deliver and deploy resources across this region is that if you understand that the people who are the, the drivers of this, the people who are how you connect into rural communities, these are people who are leading these places who may be retired football coaches, retired teachers, who wanted to invest in their community. And somebody asked them and said, you should serve in a role of public service and run for mayor. And now they got to understand and deal with city budgets county budgets. That wasn't their experience. That wasn't their training. And now we tell them we have these resources for them. Come get them. Come do this and come do that. What are we as entities, agencies doing for them? It's not just saying, hey, we got money. That's not how you engage with rural America. That's not how you engage with people who are doing the work that they're doing to support their community regardless of what they have access to. So that piece of what can we be doing and how do we start to think about this is, is meet people where they are. You know, one of the things that, that we are doing even as an agency, and I'm born and raised and grew up in these places, are going back and doing an eight state tour across the rural parts of what we cover going into the coffee shops in small towns where business happens and gets done. Going to the different meetings to understand the specific needs, not just, and connecting those specific needs to all the things that we know that data tells us. And we have to leverage that qualitative data that we know of people and community with the research data that exists. So when we do our work and deploy, we are meeting with people where they are. And to that point of how we are engaging across our states, um, we have started to actually convene and talk talk with the state directors who are doing broadband implementation across our region. As an agency, we are trying to figure out how do we support existing work in figuring out those places and communities that are left out or unattended to, and where we can bring our role as a federal agency along with other federal partners to say, hey, let's look at this. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will say our role in this space allows us to convene mm -hmm. and to have conversations to understand what's happening and what's going on, but it also gives us the opportunity to, to go in deeper and build real relationships with those places and communities that have been left out. And, and I, I bring up Alita and talk about this work often. We were just two weeks ago, I think, in, in Clarksdale, uh, Mississippi, doing just that. And that type of work, that type of work is the work that we can be doing, whether it's in nonprofits, policy work, federal agencies, for profit, is making those intentional connections and for us not to just talk about it and write about it because what folks are going to want to see in these communities is the real tangible deployment of those dollars and resources. Okay, I'll be got these drinks outside <laughs> and so reception. If, if we could make meet people where they are, a, a national motto, we'd be a lot better in this country. <laughs> <laughs>
True, true. A lot of our policies are not designed to meet people where they are. Uh -huh. When we mess up, it's because we've not met people where we are. If there are any lessons to be learned from COVID, from the dissemination of PPE and vaccines and everything else, mm -hmm. gotta meet people where they are. Second, transparency. Mm -hmm. You can go to the FCC's website today and read how T-Mobile is deploying its network, what our speed tests are. We're gonna be, we have been filing and will be filing those speed tests with the FCC for the next uh, three years. And when you look at independent rating agencies like Ookla and JD Power, they're coming back consistently. Our 5G network, we're the only ones really in the United States building a 5G network. We think it's gonna be a competitive alternative in a mix of technology, including fiber, including cable. Uh, judge us on what we say and judge us on, on what we do. Last point, I've only got two people between me and the CEO of the company. So if you wanna to talk to the ISPs, at least at T-Mobile, you can come talk to me. Um, I, I'm on a first name basis with the CEO. Uh, it's not hard to get to him. If there's anything you wanna to talk to T-Mobile about, track me down. Spencer knows how to find me. Everybody in this meeting. I'll get fine. All right, Alita, you wrap us up here. Uh, yeah, I. Um, I guess I would say, educate your communities, educate your families, uh, make sure that people know what is available to them and how to access it. This is going to take a major organizing campaign at the ground level, in order for our communities to be served. Uh, when this money is all gone. So um, I, I'm grassroots. So go into community and let them know what they should be expecting and how to ask questions and how to monitor and be vigilant about where this money is going. Okay, so I hope you all enjoy, come on out and have some refreshments uh, uh, here uh, in terms of our reception. And could you all please join me in thanking our outstanding panel.